Last time we were minimizing an integral or a functional of the form uh, L of x, x dot, and t, where x is a function of t. And <clears throat> this whole integral we called the action. And we figured out that to find the function x, which minimizes this integral given that it satisfies some boundary condition, that we're gonna find out that there's a differential equation satisfied, which is the derivative of this L function uh, with respect to x minus the time derivative of derivative with respect to x dot must be equal to zero. This is the Euler-Lagrange equation. So we're gonna run into a generalization of that today by trying to minimize a functional which gives us path length constrained to a space. So what I mean by that is this. So if we have two points on the plane, what's the shortest path between them? Well, it's gonna be a line. You can prove this, really rather derive it, uh, using the calculus of variations. Uh, but what if we don't have something quite so simple as a plane? Suppose we have something curvy that looks like uh, uh, like this, and it, okay, this is a terrible drawing, but some curvy surface, specifically surfaces today, we're talking about two-dimensional objects, if you will, we're talking about uh, two manifolds, differentiable two manifolds, and we're interested in paths on those manifolds, on those surfaces, so one-dimensional paths, and we're interested in the, in the ones which have the least length, right, that they minimize your distance inside this surface. These are called geodesics. So, geodesics. So we've now introduced the problem of finding geodesics on a surface. Let's solve it. All right, now suppose x, which is going to be equal to x, y, z, is a function of two variables. In other words, it is parameterized by two parameters, and it is a two-dimensional object. So we'll, we'll call those parameters u and v, so that this is x of u, v, y of u, v, and z of u, v. Or if you'd like, just x of u, v. All right, and now it, this is going to define a surface for us if we give u and v a certain domain. And what we're interested in is minimizing the length of a path on that surface. So what we're interested in is u and v being both functions of a single independent variable, a parameter parameterizing our parameters. It's parameterception. Uh, is equal to u of, we'll say, t and v of t. All right, so this means that x is essentially x of u of t, v of t. And we're interested in minimizing the, the length of what? So we're going to be interested in minimizing arc length here, which in three-dimensional space is going to be given by the square root of x dot squared plus y dot squared plus z dot squared dt. So that if x, y, and z are functions of the variable t, which, albeit indirectly, they are, then we can, uh, we can square the components, add them up, and then take the square root, and this is going to be our distance in three-dimensional space, right? Another way of writing this is we are interested in minimizing the integral of the magnitude of the vector dx dt dt. Now, because of the chain rule, derivative with respect to, say, let's just say y, uh, the derivative of y with respect to t, which is gonna be uh, that, is gonna be equal to the partial derivative of, of y with respect to u times the derivative of u with respect to t plus the partial derivative of y with respect to v times the derivative of v with respect to t. We're going to have this uh, then squared and then add to two other components here. So this is going to be a very complicated expression. So because x, y, and z are all functions of u and v, and so are their derivatives, 
that we can say that our integrand, which we called last time the Lagrangian, is going to be a function of u, u dot, v, v dot, and t, possibly. So now we have to minimize the integral of this with respect to time, and it looks kind of similar to how our Euler-Lagrange equation came about last time, except we have two functions here that are sort of inputs to L. So what is this going to change? So in similar fashion to before, we want to extremize this integral. So we're going to do basically the same thing we did before. I'm going to just arbitrarily call u equal to uh, a function of t plus a, a variable times another function of t, just like before. So we're going to have r uh, plus epsilon s, that's little s, we'll call this uh, uh, fancy like script s. Okay, <clears throat> and then we're going to call v equal to, how about rho plus delta sigma, all right, where rho and sigma are going to be functions of t, as are r and s, and epsilon and delta are going to be our independent variables. Okay, so if we make these substitutions, then you, of course, you're, just as before, we're going to get u dot is equal to r dot plus s dot, v dot is equal to rho dot plus delta sigma dot, and so we're going to get the following, that if we take a partial derivative of this with respect to, say, epsilon, partial derivative of fancy script S with respect to epsilon is going to be equal to the partial derivative of the integral over some, some t interval uh, I'm calling i of L of, what is this? r plus epsilon s, r dot plus epsilon s dot, and then I'm just going to write v, v dot, t dt. We don't need to write those in because there's no dependence upon epsilon. That's important here. Now, as my friend Amish pointed out last time, I did not justify bringing the partial derivative inside the integral. Uh, this is the Leibniz rule, and I will post a video on it another time, but let it suffice to say that it just comes from the fundamental theorem of calculus. This is going to be equal to, similarly to before, we're going to have the partial derivative with respect to u, right? So dl du times uh, s, right? Plus dl du dot times s dot, and then the rest of the partial derivatives that come from the chain rule here are going to be equal to zero, because there's no epsilon dependence. And then this is going to be with respect to t. All right, so we're once again going to stipulate the boundary conditions that s and sigma be zero on the endpoints of the interval i so that they don't affect the supposed minimum, which we're assuming to be r and rho, respectively. So that when we do integration by parts, just as before, the part that's not an integral that you evaluate is going to end up being zero. And once again, it's going to be the same thing as before, is equal to s times partial derivative of l with respect to u minus the t derivative of the partial derivative of L with respect to u dot dt. And this has to be equal to zero by the same reasons as before, so that we get that u must satisfy this Euler-Lagrange equation once again. Now we could of course take the same idea and do it again with delta, take a partial derivative with respect to delta, we're going to get that v has to satisfy the same thing. So that if we're minimizing this type of integral, we have that u and v both have to satisfy an Euler-Lagrange equation. So we have the following. So now 
In order to find geodesics on a surface, we're going to end up solving a system of two ODEs, which are usually second order and very, very nonlinear. So this is going to get very nasty very quick, and even for the simplest cases, it's pretty much not going to be solvable analytically. All right, for the case of a sphere, I will actually derive uh, both of these equations for you, and so you can see how absolutely impossible it is to solve these. All right, now to do this, I'm just gonna use the standard spherical coordinate parameterization of the unit sphere, right? So we have theta and phi as our two angles. Theta is going all the way around. Phi is just going from the top to the bottom, right? Zero to pi. So what we wanna do is figure out what the, our function L is, the distance which we need to minimize. All right, so put in vector form, this is our parameterization of our unit sphere. So we wanna take the partial derivative, right, with respect to theta and with respect to phi, because by the chain rule, if you'll believe me, the magnitude of dx dt is gonna be equal to the magnitude of partial derivative of x with respect to theta times theta dot derivative with respect to t uh, plus the partial with respect to phi times phi dot. And so this is the quantity we want to end up minimizing. So this is going to be equal to... So we're going to have a partial derivative with respect to theta is going to be equal to negative sine theta sine phi i hat plus cosine theta sine phi j hat plus uh, well, plus zero k hat, if you like. And then partial with respect to phi, it's going to be cosine theta cosine phi i hat plus sine theta cosine phi j hat minus sine phi k hat. So now if we multiply these by theta hat and phi hat, or er, theta dot and phi dot respectively and then add them, we are going to get uh, theta dot times plus phi dot is equal to, <clears throat> drum roll please, we're going to get negative sine theta sine phi times uh, theta dot plus cosine theta cosine phi, phi hat, or phi dot, sorry, uh, times i hat, <clears throat> plus cosine theta sine phi, uh, theta dot, plus sine theta cosine phi, phi dot, j hat, plus, or I guess just minus, since we've got zero up here, minus sine phi times phi dot, K hat. All right, now we have to take the magnitude of this thing, so we square each component and add them all together. So dx dt magnitude is going to be equal to our, our function L that we're looking to minimize, and this is going to be equal to a gigantic square root where we have this squared. So this is going to be uh, theta dot squared, sine squared theta, sine squared phi, plus phi dot squared, cosine squared theta, cosine squared phi, uh, minus two theta dot phi dot, uh, sine theta, cosine theta, sine phi, cosine phi. Our uh, square root is going to continue here plus theta dot squared, cosine squared theta, sine squared uh, phi, plus phi dot squared, sine squared theta, cosine squared phi, plus two theta dot phi dot, sine theta, cosine theta, sine phi, cosine phi. And our square root continues just a little bit longer. We have to square this last term plus phi dot squared sine squared phi. 
What a lovely little expression. All right, now some magic does happen here, although it's not gonna be enough to save us. Uh, <laughs> these are exactly the same term and they're gonna cancel. And then we're also gonna have that we can factor out a theta dot squared sine squared phi here and here, and then sine squared plus cosine squared is one. So this is just gonna be equal to theta dot squared times uh, sine squared of phi. So that's both those terms. And then a similar thing is gonna happen here where we factor out cosine squared of phi so that we get uh, plus phi dot squared cosine squared of phi. And then we have this still plus phi dot squared sine squared of phi. If we factor out a phi dot squared, cosine squared plus sine squared is just one. So this is gonna be equal to just this cute little expression. This is gonna be R L. I'm not gonna go through the actual steps to uh, taking all the uh, partial derivatives and everything. I'm just gonna give you what the Euler-Lagrange equations end up giving for this because it's a mess. So after all is said and done, these are gonna be <coughs> our two <laughs> differential equations to solve from the Euler-Lagrange equation uh, in terms of theta double dot and phi double dot. We wanna solve for theta and phi. <laughs> to say that this is a nonlinear system is such an understatement, I don't know how else to put it. Now, it's possible that there's simplifications I couldn't discover, and it's also very likely that even though we started with a sphere, the spherical coordinates is actually not the best choice here. I actually have a sneaky suspicion, based on what I know the answer to be, that once everything is said and done, Cartesian coordinates might actually be better here. But never, never mind that, it's still in general going to be very nonlinear and extremely unmanageable as the sphere is still a fairly simple object. So if you try to do this on just general surfaces, I mean, there's no way you could solve analytically. So what on earth are we gonna do with something like this? Well, God may have created nature, but man created numerical methods. So now I'd like to show you a method, at least a very basic method, maybe not a very great converging one, but for nonlinear equations, there's not gonna be a whole lot of general methods, which are gonna be great anyway. So I'm gonna show you a method for solving numerically these equations, and I'm gonna show you my code too that I wrote and pretty plots and stuff, so it'll be a blast. All right, suppose we are handed a, in general, coupled system of two second order differential equations like this. How could we come up with an algorithm to solve it? How do we know that X and Y are analytic? Well, we're sort of assuming they are because we're not really interested in solutions which are not at least twice differentiable. And we're also not really interested in wild and crazy solutions, at least on a smooth manifold like, like the sphere. So the analyticity assumption it's an assumption, but it's going to get us there. About some point t naught, let's say, x can be written as equal to x of t naught plus x dot of t naught times t minus t naught plus uh, 1 over 2 factorial x double dot of t naught times t minus t naught squared plus and so on. All right, now we can truncate this Taylor series as long as we stay relatively local, it's gonna look like a parabola. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, so we can say that, that x is approximately equal to x of t naught plus x dot of t naught times t minus t naught plus one half x double dot of t naught t minus t naught squared. All right, now let's look at the derivative of x, or at least the approximation to it using this, this Taylor expansion. So x dot of t near the point t naught is approximately equal to, so in the limiting case equal to, uh, x dot of t naught plus x double dot of t naught times t minus t naught. This is what we're going to find. 
Now here is the really cool part. Since we have an expression for x double dot, what we can do is in both of these expressions replace x double dot of t naught with f of x of t naught, x dot of t naught, y of t naught, y dot of t naught, t naught, t naught. Right? So that we can write x is approximately equal to x of t naught plus x dot of t naught times t minus t naught, where at least for this value we already know it, uh, plus one half t minus t naught squared, and then we put f in there. So f of uh, x naught, x dot naught, y naught, y naught, you know, you, et cetera, okay? <laughs> you plug in t naught and all uh, functions of t naught into f. All right, then x dot is approximately equal to, from this expression, x dot of t naught plus t minus t naught times, once again, f of all that business. So now we have a way to calculate an x value and an x dot value from previous x values and previous x dot values. Of course, we're also going to need the y values and the y dot values, so we do the same thing with the function y. We expand y in a Taylor series, we're going to get the exact same truncation here, uh, and we likewise we take the derivative and get the same linear approximation for y dot, and then we have x, x dot, y, y dot, and then using all, all of them together, we can iteratively find the next point by just plugging in all those values uh, into f and then g. It's, so instead of f in the, for x and y, we're going to have the function g here, and we're going to have the function g here. But then that's going to allow us to find x sub n plus 1 in terms of x sub n. So let me write the final algorithm down for you. All right, so this is going to be our final algorithm derived from truncated Taylor series. So we're going to uh, have some, some set of t values, right? This is going to be our discretized independent variable, uh, which I'm just going to have a constant delta t in my code, right? We can make it as small as we want and say this is like, uh, you know, 0 0.00001. Right, so we get a really small step size, and I'm going to keep it constant. But for the sake of the algorithm here, this is the way it would work. So then we have x sub n plus 1 in terms of x sub n, x sub n dot, right, f of all these va previous values, and then these t intervals, it's a quadratic, so it's a local uh, quadratic approximation, likewise with y, and then we have linear approximations for x dot and y dot and we can incrementally find our solution and then plot it in the end. And if we took our step size short enough, then it should be pretty good. However, I'm gonna say, with the level of nonlinearity in, in these equations, uh, even with a really tiny step size, the convergence is unbelievably slow. So, like, I took a step size of like, something like one ten thousandth, and it was like, out of control. <laughs> so, uh, but you get, you get the idea. This is the numerical algorithm we're going to use to solve our problem of geodesics. So let me go to my computer. All right, so here we are in MATLAB, and I have uh, written a little bit of a code here for us to, to examine. Uh, hopefully clean, but I'm no programmer, really. So for, you'll have to forgive me for that. <clears throat> yeah, see this? Yep, I'm not a programmer. Uh, <laughs> okay, so the idea is to uh, start with our system of ODEs that we get from the Lagrange, uh, or the Euler-Lagrange equations right, which I'm going to be calling f and g, and then we're going to use the variables uh, a to denote x, b to denote y, c to denote the derivative of x, and d to denote, denote the derivative of y. So here we have our two functions defined, which were absolutely ridiculous and insanely nonlinear. And like I said before, 
are there pro are there better coordinate systems to do this in? Yes, but the general problem on a general surface, it's it's not going to be simple no matter what. So, uh, so this principle should still work no matter what. And and what's remarkable is that the code does actually get it right. You'll see this in a bit. Even with these insanely nonlinear equations, we do get some convergence to the right answer. So here we have our initial t values. We have some initial positions. This is just where are we starting out on our sphere. And here is the initial velocities. The only thing I want to mention about this is that we is that because we have a system of differential equations, and because they are both second order equations, we need more than just initial positions, we need these initial velocities. That's just an initial value problem thing. So I just arbitrarily chose one and one for that. <clears throat> it, ha it has no real deep meaning that I can think of as pertains to the problem of geodesics. All right, so what we do is we create a discretized interval, as you can see here. Uh, and then we're going to define x, the derivative of x, y, and the derivative of y. And by the way, x and y, I guess I forgot to mention this, are going to be our phi and theta, right? <clears throat> I just put it as x and y because it's easier to uh, type and see in MATLAB. But it's no different in principle. So we <clears throat> we're going to also uh, create a vector for each of these. So we're going to calculate recall the incremented values of each of these things and then we're going to sort of plot it at the at the end so here we have a for loop and it's going to go exactly as i told you it would with the algorithm that we devised from the taylor series truncation and then uh again another uh, another little aside so in addition to graphing what's going to end up being uh, x and y or, or theta and phi, so a and b in the code, we're also going to want to graph the surface that we're moving on, right? So I have a second part of the code here, which just, this is just a parameterized sphere. And the only interesting thing to note here is that you have to use matrices because we want a two-dimensional discretization instead of up here where we just had a one-dimensional discretization, right? Just T values and A, B, C, and D evaluated at various T values. Well, for a surface, we're gonna have to have an array of values since it's two-dimensional. And so you gotta, uh, you see that, that transpose operator in MATLAB, you gotta pay attention a little bit more to the matrix side of things here. But other than that, this is just the surface parameterization of the sphere. Uh, cosine, sine, 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 cosine, you've seen this before. And then we're actually going to need two functions at the end, because w recall that this system is going to solve things in terms of theta and phi. Well, we still have to graph uh, theta and phi, right, uh, in three-dimensional space, which is what we're going to want our solution. And again, because of the technicalities of of coding this, I have actually two sets of functions here, one which takes in matrix inputs for our surface parameterization, and one which takes in vector inputs for our <clears throat> for our other for our curve, right? Our geodesic path. Um, again, there's probably better ways to do this than the way I've done it. I'm no programmer, but it works. And then here we have our our second uh, parameter domain. This is just for the surface discretization. And then at the bottom, we have final plots. So yeah, that's pretty much all there is to it. It's, it's a good thing to be able to work with, uh, with codes and MATLAB. I find that you don't really understand something well in math unless you can code it. When you code it, you have to run up against all the weird cases. And that makes you a better thinker, even if you have no interest in scientific computing or anything like that. <clears throat> So this is really healthy. Uh, let's see if there's anything else I wanted to note here. I don't think so. So let's let's run it and see what the geodesics on a sphere look like. All right, so I'm gonna move this window over here and then I'm just gonna tell it to run 
this script. And here we are. Let's uh, let's expand that a bit. So this is going to be the shortest path along the sphere. So you can look at this, and clearly it's not a straight line in space, but of course a straight line isn't going to be a path in the sphere. Um, it, it's some arc, right? Looks pretty. So our code appeared to work. It does look like the shortest path between, say, that point and that point. Now what I want you to notice is that while this is clearly not in one line, if we look at it from just the right angle, this is a heuristics argument, of course it's not rigorous, uh, we see that it looks like a straight line, it's so it, like the projection of it onto sort of an axis going this way, it looks like a straight line. And that's because the curve is going to be planar. So you see one of the essential features of geodesics on a sphere, which is that they are contained in a single plane. Moreover, there's only one other feature we really need to note to figure out what these geodesics are, and that's that if we look really closely, it should appear, let's see if I can get the positioning just right, it should appear that this straight line goes through, that this plane, that this curve is going gonna, is gonna to lie in, should intersect the sphere and go through the center of the sphere, right? The point uh, at which all points on the surface of the sphere are equidistant, um, that are equidistant from. So we have that this, this curve, whatever it is, it lies on the surface of the sphere, it lies in a single plane, and that plane goes through the center of the sphere. And these are none other than the great circles, as they're called. So you see just by numerical uh, analysis here and then a little bit of heuristic reasoning we can figure out exactly what geodesics on a sphere are they are <clears throat> they are the great circles on the sphere or any arc that's part of a great circle and that's it and of course you could you could run this code for uh, other curves other parameterized surfaces uh, the only things that would change would be these functions f and g, right, which give, which are from your differential equations, your Euler-Lagrange equations, uh, you could change. Uh, well, you could change details like discretizations, but you don't need to. You could, uh, <coughs> uh, let's see, uh, you would change the surface parameterization as well, right, depending on what surface you want to show that your curve is a geodesic on, you change this. But other than that, it's pretty adaptable to other surfaces. So we find in the end that Though our Euler-Lagrange equations lead to somewhat of a difficult analytical challenge, we can meet that challenge with numerical methods. And so we found the geodesics on a surface, more, more generally than even a sphere.